For over 100 years, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach has been serving Iowans. As our state recovers from COVID-19, we will continue to deliver information and education based on research to help you care for your family, manage stress, and support your community, your business, and your farm. We're here for you now, and we will be for the next 100 years. Together, we will build a strong Iowa. Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to Become an EM Tree, Observe Your Plants to Prevent Problems. Uh, this is a three-week session uh, of some figuring out some problems between your plants and preventing problems. This is uh, brought to you by the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic, along with a partner effort between four counties uh, of ISU Extension Outreach offices. Uh, my name is Kevin Potterbaum. I'm from Woodbury County. Uh, which is also in part with, brought to you by Polk County, Dubuque County, and Mahaska County. Um, we, welcome, we welcome you to uh, this first session. We'd like you to join us in the comments. Uh, tell us where you're joining us from and how you heard about the program. Uh, if you're watching via Facebook Live, uh, you can obviously comment right into the uh, chat bar there. Um, if you're watching us on a website that we've embedded this onto, um, if you would like to join us in the comments, you're going to have to open that. There should be a bottom up at the bottom, uh, a button at the bottom that says open in a YouTube browser. You can uh, open it. It'll go into a browser with YouTube on there and you can join us in the comments there. Uh, again, if you do join us in the comments, let us know where you're joining us from and how you heard about the program. And like I said, we're, we're glad to have you here. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the first of three weeks um, for this Become an EM Tree series. Uh, today's workshop is the Art and Science of Plant Problem Diagnosis. Uh, we're going to be joined by Dr. Lena Rodriguez Salamanca, and she's going to uh, lead today's session. Uh, be sure to look out uh, this fall. Um, obviously, everybody's getting excited to uh, get back into the hands-on programs, and we are planning on doing some hands-on programs with these exact topics that you're seeing here today, just a little more in-depth. Um, hopefully, these virtual sessions will We'll get you excited about um, how to detect these problems on your own, and then uh, we can show you a little more hands-on what's going on with it. Again, those, those hands-on programs this fall will be brought to you by uh, the extension offices that have partnered in with these virtual sessions, and that's Woodbury County, uh, Mahaska County, Dubuque County, and Polk County. Um, and again, if, you, if you're unaware, the sessions, uh, today's session is the Art and Science of Plant Problem Diagnosis. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at insects and you, and then two weeks from now, the common plant problems in Iowa, what resources are out there. Um, and again, we want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, now I'm going to pull onto the screen with us, Lena Rodriguez Salamanca, and as I mentioned, she will be leading today's discussion on the art and science of plant problem diagnosis. Uh, Lena, great to have you, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome, everyone. Um, I am excited to be here, and thank you for regist registering. I saw all the questions that you posed. Um, and today, I'm going to share a little bit of uh, my professional life. Uh, I work in plant problem diagnosis here at Iowa State campus um, and have been do doing this for six years, almost six years. And I want to give you an introduction to make sure that um, this season, you get into looking at your plants often, enjoying the joy that they bring to our lives, but also looking them often uh, and knowing what to look for uh, so that hopefully we can keep those plants uh, healthy and when problems arise, you get them solved right away. So when it comes to diagnosis, there's three main pillars that um, I think about. Uh, the knowledge of the plan, the symptoms and signs that you may see when a problem comes, and any patterns in time and space. So it's all about clues that you slowly collect as you are monitoring and looking and enjoying your plants throughout the season. So let's talk about knowledge about the plant. And I am a plant pathologist, a microbiologist. I live in a world of microorganisms. I spend my life under the microscope. So the knowledge of the plant is very important. You need to know who is sick so that that plant identification is very important. And I reach out to a lot of my horticulture colleagues for plant ID so that I know who I am looking into. 
who is the problem, well, who's the plan that I'm dealing with. Um, why? Because it's very important to know what is healthy. Very often I get this uh, question in the clinic, uh, this is a leaf of a sycamore tree. And under the, on the underside of the leaf, you may see this fussiness and you may think, oh, what, what is that? Is, is that a fungus? What exactly the question that I received in, in um, prior years in the clinic. Well, it turns out that this is totally normal. It's hair, um, it's called pubescence uh, on this particular uh, tree on sycamores and it's completely normal. So that's why it's important to know what is healthy for that plant. The other part is what problems are possible or likely. They're very common problems uh, that we see in Iowa, uh, but also diseases and insects tend to run in plant families, meaning they're host specific. And of course, there's some exceptions, so let's look at both. Um, the first one here, um, this one is fire blight. You may have heard of this disease. It's caused by a bacterial pathogen, and you will see this disease in apples and pears on that family, but you will not see it on stone fruit um, or ornamental prunus like cho choke cherries. As far as those exceptions, that's what I like to call uh, the pathogens that are not picky eaters. They will go to everything and anything. Uh, and examples that I see on the clinic often are uh, fungal pathogens that cause cankers in woody plants. And I see them throughout a vast variety of shrubs and trees. All right, let's go to the second uh, pillar of diagnosis, observing symptoms and signs. So let's first understand and remember if you're a master gardener and have taken the training, you've seen me talk about this most likely. But remember, symptoms are the plant's responses to a causal agent. Um, in other words, they're the visible response to a plant pathogen, the plant pathogen that is causing the disease, or an insect. In some cases, you'll see symptoms associated to non-infectious factors or abiotic problems. Um, a lot of the, the terms that I'm going to use today, we do have a resource, uh, a glossary on the horticulture and home pest news with all the definitions. Uh, and at the end of uh, my presentation, we're going to post all those links for you to have available. All right, so back to different types of symptoms. The most often uh, symptoms we see on the clinic are leaf spots. Those will be well-defined, discolored or dead areas on the leaves. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here we have uh, this tarry, tarry looking spot on maples. Uh, the disease is called tar spot. Uh, we plant pathologists are not known for our um, innovative names. <laughs> uh, on the right, we have needle discoloration, another uh, very familiar symptom that we get in the clinic with those needles turn brown to purple um, and they fall. Um, and that disease is called needle cast and it's caused by a fungus. Now, blight um, is a symptom that describes a general and rapid death of leaves, branches, twigs, or flower parts. And what is interesting is, in general, blight um, will have the pathogen. The pathogen is located we are, where you are seeing the symptom, per se. Uh, so those samples are very easy to collect. They get to me. I can get the correlation going or the test going. Um, and so it's important to collect enough sample and, and that is uh, fresh. Now, when it comes to wilt, and this one is um, easily confused with blight. Um, wilt means the loss of rigidity and drooping of plant parts, generally caused by a disturbance in the water conducting tissues of the tree or shrub. <clears throat> so what you end up is, if there's a pathogen that is on those vascular tissues, vascular vessels, eventually the farther uh, the highest leaves are going to start showing that drooping look, that lack of water uh, look. And this one, when you have the symptom, it's one of the hardest ones to sample for because the pathogen is not in the leaves, it's actually in the vascular system. Cankers, we talked about cankers when we see sunken lesions, sometimes raised, like in the one in spruce on, on the left here. Um, you can see this uh, symptom on branches. Uh, or twigs, unfortunately, sometimes in the trunk of young trees or shrubs. Um, and for the most part, you'll have that uh, border 
uh, that you can see here on the, the honey locust, where the pathogen is killing the tissue and moving into the healthy tissue, creating that border effect. So, okay, now you have an idea of what symptoms you may see out there and what to look for. Of course, there's many more, check out our, our glossary. But as you, as you look at your plants, make sure that you are looking at where those symptoms may be. Um, do an entire plant exam, what's happening in the leaves, in the flowers or fruits, if they are available, in the branches and the trunk at the base of the tree or shrub. At the clinic, um, we normally like to see root systems in certain um, in particular occasions, especially if we're thinking there is a crown rot or a rot pathogen on the root system. Um, and so also at the clinic, we looked at internal tissues and depending on what you're inspecting, you may consider doing this if it's not gonna cause more harm than, than good. Now, because we only have uh, so much time tonight, um, I want to encourage you uh, to review this uh, free to download publication. It's in here, we detail our approach to tree and shrub problems. Again, how to examine the tree, um, all the different symptoms, examples of symptoms with photos, examples, uh, examples of signs with photos, uh, and a lot of great information. Again, it's free to download, and we'll give you this link at the end of the presentation. But on a nutshell, it's important that you train yourself to um, observe and describe symptoms. And if you are into journaling, this will be for you. Super easy. If you're not, then like you may be into taking photos and that may be a good way of observing uh, and capturing those symptoms. And in general, collect information. Information that you're not sure may be important, may be important in the future. So it's important to have those photos. Um, these days, you can have photos in the cloud and your phone everywhere. Um, and it's so much fun to just have a garden journal. Now, the other part is not only symptoms, but you want to make sure that you train your eyes to look for any signs that may develop. So let's review a little bit here. What are signs? So those are visible portions of an organism, either a pathogen or insect or its products. And notice that the visible has a star next to it because sometimes, especially when we're talking about microscopic pathogens, you may not see the pathogen. You need magnification in order to see it. And my example here is, look at this oak um, with that white substance on the top of the leaves. To, in order to see the pathogen itself, the products of, of the, that pathogen, you have to use magnification and then you will see uh, the structures of the powdery mildew pathogen on the right here magnified uh, in the microscope at the clinic. Sometimes in the clinic we receive um, trunk or branches that may have um, anything from galleries or tunnels and our entomologist uh, will find you know, little larva here and there that she's she's identifying to see what role are they playing uh, on the problem that we're trying to um, diagnose. Um, among the largest signs that we may see in trees and shrubs are mushrooms. Uh, there is a lot of mushrooms that uh, will go into uh, colon colonizing those woody tissues. Uh, some of them will be at the very base of the tree. Some of them will be at, uh, in the trunk or anything in between. The problem with these mushrooms is they tend to cause what in the literature you may find as butt rot. I know it's super funny, butt rot, because the mushroom is able to start decomposing and decaying that wood on the tree. So that normally is not very good news because this makes the tree unsafe. Um, and if we have wind, uh, derecho, like we had last year, those are the trees that be will become unsafe and may fail in the near future. More fun signs. So these ones are spore pustules. On the left, we have ash, um, leaves of ash, and this is ash rust. So the spores of this fungal pathogen form on this tiny tubes that we call pustules. 
Um, and on the right, we have a close-up of a very similar pathogen, rust, uh, as a fungal pathogen, different one than the one in ash, but these little tubes are formed in the fruit of a hawthorn, and they look like that. Galls and horns are also signs. Um, right now, I bet somewhere out there in cedars, you will encounter this uh, alien looking structures is a little ball, a gall that has those horns. And under the right conditions, when um, we have lots of humidity or rain, those horns will become gelatinous. And that gelatin looking orange thing on your left um, is where the spores of the fungus um, reproduces and becomes ready and is picked up by the wind. Um, and this pathogen is one that has starts over winters and cedar, and then it will move into apples or hawthorns. All right, so a lot of the things that I've shown you so far, um, the last two slides have been very cosmetic. Now, this one is one that um, I want you to be aware, especially if you're an oak lover like I am. Um, oak wilt is a deadly disease of oaks, um, and it can kill oaks on the red oak group, meaning pin oaks or red oaks, those oaks that have pointy leaves. And those that pathogen can kill those oaks in about one season. The problem is, if the tree goes undiagnosed and it dies on that season, the pathogen will reproduce in the trunk of the tree and will create this fungal mats. So it's that gray looking mat uh, on your right here. Um, and it creates this, it exudates a fruity smell. And that fruity smell will attract beetles that will land there and get spores on their little legs and then move into uh, healthy oaks. Um, this is why we want everyone to stop pruning oaks um, around, you know, only prune oaks in the winter. And stop pruning oaks February, sometimes March, depending on the weather. Because the moment that those beetles become active, then the possibility, the risk of transmission um, of those beetles picking up that fungus and taking it to healthy ones increases enormously. And we want to make sure that we are protecting our healthy oaks. Um, also, keep your eyes peeled for symptoms of oak wilt. That wilting on the top of the tree, rapid wilting on red oaks, uh, pin oaks. Um, but it's a lot slower in white oaks, burr oaks, and swamp white oaks. Um, so if you have questions, of course, we'll have a link for oak wilt for you at the end. Uh, if you have questions about submitting a sample, do get in touch with us, um, and we'll, ha we'll be happy to help you uh, either rule out or confirm this is the case. Now we got to the signs that are my favorite. Those that are microscopic. Um, like I said, and here I'm showing you some signs are very small to see. So even though you may be looking for them, you really need magnification. Um, so here, I hope you see my course, my cursor here. Um, I have uh, crushed roots um, from a plant and I have some um, water mold uh, resting structures here. Um, here leaves, I have fungal bodies uh, oozing spores. Then what I looked into is the, the fungal bodies, the sizes, the shapes, uh, and then how those spores are produced inside those fungal bodies. That's all that I use for identification um, of, the, of the plant pathogens. All right, so remember we talked about fire blight symptoms, blight and cankers, right? I hope by now you, you're with me. Um, now, how about the signs? Well, early in the spring, if we have a lot of humidity, you may catch a sign of this bacterium, Erwinia armillivora, as little droplets. If they're fresh and we had a lot of humidity, you may have this um, like milky droplets, like this one on the left here, the bottom um, arrow. If they're dry, they turn kind of orange, like you see on the top red arrow. You may see this ooze on the fruit too, if we have exceptionally humid conditions um, during the season. All right, so we're getting to the third pillar of diagnosis. And this is the most exciting and the one that I want you to take with you as you are planting your garden, looking at your shrubs and trees. 
because patterns in times and space are the clues that we diagnosticians and everyone that is trying to solve pro plant problems, master gardeners, your uh, county horticulturalist, um, your friends, everyone should be looking for patterns. That is really important information. And of course, how do we go about finding patterns? Asking a lot of questions. So how old is the plant? When it was planted, where did, they, where did it come from? You know, we're about to start getting more and more into plant sales. It's important to look at your plants closely for any strange symptoms that are not normal on that plant. What was in the area before you planted? Often, if you are going into moving into a new home uh, and you really want to plant a crab apple, you, you need to think about was, what was here before. Uh, how is the soil structure? All these different things. Um, what it may have happened in this area in the last 10 years, was there any construction or grade, grade changes? And that will be very, very important with trees and shrubs because any construction that may be close by to a large tree or a shrub may have an important impact on the root system, either injure it on its own or allowing an entryway for pathogens. Now, is this the first victim or the first plant that you're seeing this, this problem? Sometimes you really love a particular shrub and you may want that shrub back on that area. But if you have the same problem over and over again, then you may start thinking, is there something in my soil? What was what's happening here? Um, of course, that's hard if this is a new place to you that you're moving into, um, but it, it's part of um, having those records, that fun garden book where you can have, you know, notes of what thrive where and what did not work uh, on a particular set of your property. And again, photos. There's so much information you can extract from photos that we in the clinic, if, we, if you need our help, can extract from photos. Um, we do have um, a, a website where we give you our tips to take uh, digital um, photos. And the good thing is digital photos are free. Uh, we, don't, we don't ask you to print them or anything. Um, however, I should say, uh, that photos are good to collect information, collect patterns, snapshot of symptoms, maybe signs that you think could be important, collect all those clues. But when it comes to making a diagnosis from photos, it is really hard. And I'll give you an example, normal example that we'll get at the clinic. What is wrong with my tree here? And my question to you is, yes, you, you get an idea relatively, um, okay, the, I see the leaves are affected. I don't know what's happening with the branch. Um, they seem very similar, um, affected by the borders of the leaves. They're browning, they're kind of scorching. But what else may be going on with this particular tree? I can tell that it's closed in the city. So then I want to know how much concrete is around there. I also love to see the bottom of the tree. So if you send me more photos than here, I can see that, that symptoms on the leaves are really widespread uh, on the canopy, at least on the bottom half. And from this photo on, I will ask you to give me a snapshot of the base of the tree, um, and if possible, dig around. Um, because this, to me, looks more like an environmental, more abiotic, not necessarily infectious problem. Uh, and I, I, unless I have ruled out things or have identified a pathogen, for testing, this may be more a, of an abiotic problem. So we just did um, an investigation, a quick investigation of that area on those photos. Um, but as you continue to look at a problem and investigate it, um, see if there are other plants that are affected. Um, look at the plants nearby, look if they have symptoms that are similar, uh, think about what stressor treatments or other um, effects, uh, factors have uh, those plants in common. Um, are there any concrete or buildings nearby? That's definitely a temperature differential when a plant, when a tree or a shrub is really close by um, a house. Um, also inspect like what is the soil and the drainage like for that plant, for that area where that plant is located. That will be very, very important. 
mainly because the drainage will contribute to um, abiotic problems, but because some pathogens absolutely take advantage of poorly drained soils and can cause uh, root rots. And again, what patterns are you seeing? So this is all about looking for patterns. So let's talk about is that are the symptoms or the signs on the upper leaves or on the lower leaves? And on the lower leaves, you may be thinking, okay, there are some nutrients that can move from the bottom of the leaves, they're translocated, to help the younger leaves grow. However, there are many fungi and bacteria that will start causing problems in the lower leaves and move up. Now, if the problem is in the upper leaves, then maybe you're dealing with a, a nutrient that is immobile, that will be just only available in, um, on the base of the, of the plant and not able to be translocated uh, on the upper leaves. It could be a virus uh, or it could be a vascular wilt pathogen. Remember, vascular wilt pathogens, they specialized on colonizing the vascular tissue of the plant that the plant uses to move water and nutrients. Um, and therefore, the first leaves that will be affected will be the upper leaves or the side leaves. All right, what patterns are you seeing? Are you seeing the symptoms on one side of the plant um, in all leaves and in individual branches? If you see the symptoms on all leaves, we may be talking about an abiotic stress or stress factor, especially if it was static in time and space, it may just start it and stay the same. However, if it's changing um, and advancing, you may be thinking about a root rot here, uh, or there may be something in the main stem. It could be a border, an insect border, or uh, something like a mushroom draining all the nutrients from the bottom of the, of the plant. If you're seeing symptoms on one side, once again, a vascular will pathogen may very well be causing those symptoms. Um, or it could be a root rot. And remember, the root rot could start on one side and then move throughout the canopy of that um, woody plant or tree. Um, now, if you see problems with individual branches, um, those are actually the easiest ones to manage because often uh, they may be a canker. Um, or uh, if you find a sharp transition, it could be a mechanical injury, an animal, uh, or simply um, anything that may have uh, disrupted the flow of nutrients into that branch. Are we doing on time? Pretty good. Okay. The other thing is the timeline. As you're looking at patterns, also ask yourself the timeline. Does the symptoms develop suddenly? Um, and this is where if you've been taking photos, then you can go back and say, oh, wait a minute. There was something weird a week ago. Or this is not really sudden. A lot of people, especially if you're not looking at your plants often, would think that something occurs suddenly. But if you have those photo records, you may discover that the pattern is different. Anyway, if it is truly sudden and this problem does not progress, uh, the symptoms do not change, you might likely be dealing with an abiotic uh, problem or a non-infectious problem, meaning most likely no pathogen or insect is going to be um, present. Now, if the symptoms do expand and change over time, sometimes it will really depend on the season. Um, if a pathogen likes cooler temperature, then it will be more April to May. If a pathogen thrives in hotter conditions and you'll see the symptoms at peak in August, uh, you'll see in that transition, then it's likely biotic, meaning a disease caused by a pathogen or, or an insect or a combination of both. And this timeline occur simply because in order for disease development, you need to have a susceptible host and favorable environment for that pathogen or insect uh, to thrive and the pathogen present. Um, and when you have all those conditions, then the symptoms will start and depending on the environment, the symptoms would either peak rapidly or develop slowly. 
All right, so talking about timeline on the plant are the symptoms or the, the, the uh, problem that you're noticing. Is it developing from the inside out or the bottom up or the outside in and the top down? So if the inside out and bottom up uh, may be the case, this is very common for fungal or bacterial infections. Um, while the outside in or top down, it's very uh, likely that could be a root rot problem, that it may be related with the soil characteristics, if the soil is too heavy or it's not draining well, or it could be abiotic. All right, so the other part is I, I do enjoy a lot of uh, book, book work uh, in, my, in my job. I, we have an extensive library at the clinic and I also have a lot of electronic resources. And if you join us for the third um, workshop, I will be sharing with you some of those resources. Um, but when I am ready to go into my book, wor book work, um, then, I will again look at what are common problems of this kind of plant. Um, what possible suspects are there? So I do have a list of things that, that are possible and what to check for. And can you shrink that list of suspects? Can you rule out any possibilities confidently? Uh, or you may need to collect more evidence. And at the clinic very often, we back and forth email, so sort of call our clients to make sure that we're not missing anything and that we're collecting all that information. Um, as a diagnostician, Ed and I, uh, the diagnosticians that worked on, on plant problems um, along with our entomologist, we um, keep ourselves humble. We always know when to seek assistance and that um, could be consulting with local or regional extension specialists. Um, we have access to national diagnosticians and national experts. And we want to encourage you to do the same. Um, we're all in this together. You have wonderful resources at your county offices, um, extension horticulturalists that may be able to help, master gardeners that are experienced and very uh, well-trained um, to and comfortable to do some diagnostics as long as it's a cosmetic problem that is not going to have an impact on your community. But if the concern is pressing or you're suspecting a deadly disease that is going to have a long-term impact on your yard, city, community, or park, um, do get in touch with us. Uh, do get in touch with the DNR if there's someone in your area that can help you out. Uh, and if you're willing to submit a sample, get in touch with us. Send us some photos. We have lots of information on how to collect a sample, um, especially for if you are thinking, okay, where is the pathogen? Is this a wilt problem? And therefore, we need to make sure that vascular system is sent to the clinic, or is this a blight problem where just leaves will suffice? Um, what if one of the suspects is a root rot? How do we go about collecting those, uh, those uh, roots? And we can guide you uh, on all of those uh, questions. So just to wrap up, I want to encourage you to Winter's over and we're all jubilous about it. It's time to enjoy your plants, look at them often, take photos, know what is normal. Um, and as you notice strange things, snap some photos, make some notes on your garden um, journal. Uh, because the, the, the most important, when we talked about scouting, as you find uh, a problem, when you find it earlier, the more tools and tactics you will have to actually manage it now and in the future with less implications. So with that, I wanna remind you that we have another couple sessions on April 20th, Insects and You, uh, and April 27th, join me. Uh, I'll show you some of those common plant problems in Iowa and some resources. Um, and um, as Kevin said earlier, we are hoping to have hands-on programs on those four counties um, COVID allows. Um, and with that, keep us in mind, follow us on Facebook, uh, and I'll exit my screen here to check out your questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Lena. It looks like right now I haven't seen any questions roll in, but uh, for you viewers, if you have some questions, feel free to put them in now. Um, we did share the evaluation for today's session. Um, we would like people to take part and 
letting us know how uh, how it's going. I will just to kind of help out a little bit, um, show another way. If down the road um, you'd like to check this out, um, you can see the evaluation link. Uh, if you go on to uh, the Woodbury County Extension page um, and go under Agriculture and Environment down at Yard and Garden Agriculture, uh, this page, we are live streaming um, directly onto that page. Uh, and underneath of that is where we do have an evaluation link. Um, so a great opportunity there if you need to uh, turn in the evaluation. Otherwise, like I said, it is shared in the comments. Uh, so anybody should have the opportunity um, to put that through if they would like. Um, and again, let's see, oh, it looks like we do have a question popping in um, from Diane Toma. I don't know if that's Thomas or if I was just supposed to be Toma. The ash borer, we're going now after trees have been taken down. Any other trees to watch? Well, um, first of all, I'm for full disclosure, I am not an entomologist. Uh, my colleague Laura, who would be talking uh, in the next session, uh, is an entomologist. Um, I have heard her say that we're watching uh, for an invasive species um, that is uh, hanging out in the border of Ohio now, um, the spotted lanternfly. Um, so that's our next invasive on the list. And unfortunately, it's a, a broad host uh, range. It will love maples and a lot of other trees. Um, but uh, she'll be a lot better than me to answer that question. And again, next week, uh, we are going to look a lot into the insects and you is next week's topic. So yeah, we can see that one, seeing some other things. Um, but this one looks like we just had something just die and they pruned it in the fall. Could Granny T have killed it? Ooh, I don't know. So this is the type of question that I go to my horticultural friends. So Ray, if you're there and you have an idea, um, because when it comes to pruning, I can recommend you how to prune uh, a, a shrub or a tree when you have a canker on that tree that is diagnosed. Uh, and I can tell you that you should go at least six to 12 inches from that last edge of the canker and making sure that you clean your pruning shears or your little saw or whatever you used uh, with alcohol. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, uh, if my horticultural friends have a, an answer, that will be great. Okay, we have this one from Carol Camp. What pathogen or disease causes a Honeycrisp apple trees to lose bark on the branches? Well, my first uh, non-pathogen, I don't, not any pathogen that I can think of. I'm thinking of um, hungry squirrels. I'm thinking of uh, winter injury uh, that could happen depending on where you're seeing the symptoms, um, especially if, if those branches are getting a lot of the south facing sun uh, and tall and freeze um, cycles and during the winter can be very hard on bark. Um, especially maples though, I don't know, um, and apples, the, win the injury um, that I see is, is more, uh, it's flattened, not necessarily uh, sloughing of bark. Good questions, guys. And again, um, Lena, I don't know if you just want to share some of the, some of the easiest resources like you talked about, uh, local extension offices with some questions if you have any come in. Um, as far as the, the taking pictures, um, is there an easy approach to, to upload them all to get them to anyone? Or how do you uh, recommend for people to turn in just individual problems? Yes, excellent question. So at the clinic, uh, we do have an intake form, a submission form. Um, and we like that you use that instead of emailing photos, mainly because we do have questions for you to think about that talk about this patterns, the symptoms, and, and kind of get you thinking about what you've seen uh, and give us a full description of the problem, as opposed to going back and forth multiple times via email. This form will keep all your photos there uh, and all your information there. And if you do decide uh, to send a sample uh, after we have made a recommendation, you can just print that form and that could be your submission form uh, for that sample. Okay, looks like we do have another question I'm finding um, from the flower lady. 
I don't like to spray our apple tree. However, I noticed the last two years I have been getting pocket worms. I usually cut the pockets out as I see them. Do you have a better suggestion? Boy, I wish Laura was here. Um, <laughs> I, um, I am not sure um, what would be the answer here. Um, again, I'm, I'm more of a microscopic pathogen, fungi, bacteria, virus, oh, my seed water mold type of girl. Uh, not worms. That will be Laura. <laughs> um, well, the, good, the, the good news is, remember, for all for all these questions, save them for next week. We'll have to we'll have to combine some of these and get them ready. And Laura's going to have a busy week to, next week. That's for sure. Um, see, this one from Valerie is sap dripping from a very old oak a sign or symptom of a problem. OK, so sometimes and I, I will always love to see a photo, of course. Um, when I see, when I think of um, liquid dripping from an oak tree, um, I think of either a yeast or a bacteria um, type of secretion. And they're normally not um, something that we consider harmful or something that we can treat. Um, so in a way, for, for that question, um, it's more of a symptom because you're seeing the secretion on itself. Um, once you see either the yeast or the bacteria under the microscope, then that will be the sign. All right. And again, um, you know, any questions that you may have that you aren't thinking right now or would like to be answered, uh, remember on the on the evaluation, you can always put in some comments there. Um, and I believe even our uh, if, if you registered for this event, you should be getting sent uh, some email reminders. And on those, I believe there's there's a spot where you enter in any questions that you might have either leading up to a session or afterwards. Um, so be sure everyone to, to have those filled out and send those to us. Um, you know, that gives us a little bit easier time too, where we can look things up if we're not quite sure and, and really give you the best answer. And, you know, that's the thing about uh, extension is like Lena had talked about, um, we're not going to try to fake it if we don't know the answer, but we can sure as heck find uh, find the right answer for you. Um, and it does, as far as I can tell, look like we hit up all the questions that came in today. We'll give it here uh, just a just a bit more to see if any more come rolling in. But uh, again, um, we want to thank everybody for joining us uh, for this first session of Become an EM Tree. I hope you learned a little bit and we'll continue to, to gain more knowledge. Um, but we do have something coming in. Um, there is growth on the branches from the from what we had talked about earlier, as well as white spots on the bark. Um, just quick, try to find what that initial question was, Lena, to help you out. Uh, this was she was worried that her pruning it might have killed it. Um, so if that helps at all, and again, we can we can kind of get back. Um, if you want to leave. Uh, any more of your contact information or if you if you fill out the evaluation and just reference that um, this is who you are, we can try to make sure to, to get any more detailed answers to let you know um, if pruning it might have had any any effect. Yeah, I'm really curious about this white spots on the bark. Um, so one of the points I made earlier was, um, you know, knowing that plan, what plan you're um, looking into and then what is normal on that plant. Um, so a lot of plants do have um, the little pockets that is the way that they will exchange um, the oxygen and the CO2. Um, so either hyatodes, like we know of those in the leaves that stomata is the name, but in the in the bark, I believe it's either, um, oh, it's lenticels, sorry, the lenticels. So sometimes um, people will be concerned about lenticels, but it really, it's, it's completely normal uh, and a lot, and most of them, you can, most of the woody uh, shrubs and, and trees that we get, especially apples is the ones that I have in my mind because I've been working on some apples, uh, apple samples. And you can see those, those uh, lenticels and you can see them. And often I check the lenticels because the fungal bodies may be forming there, um, but on their own, they should be all very similar and spread out throughout the whole wood. So do check and see those white spots. Are they in one location? Are they spread out throughout the whole branch? In that case, there may be those lenticels. And if they're not, then maybe it could be a scale insect, for example. Um, there's a lot of fussy white things that 
I, I need Laura's help to differentiate. There is uh, woolly aphids and there's other scales that in my eyes, I'm, I look at them and I'm like, I just say, Laura, what, which one is which? And I just leave it to her because she is the, the, the queen of the insect identification. All right, well, I think that uh, that should be it for today. Again, we wanna thank everybody for joining us. We wanna thank uh, Dr. Lena Rodriguez Salamanca for putting on today's presentation. Again, and you can catch Lena again, you're doing the third presentation as well, is that correct? Yes. Yep, so you'll see her um, on the 27th in two weeks. So we haven't gotten rid of her completely yet. Uh, but again, thanks for joining us, Lena. And we wanna thank everybody for uh, joining us for today's broadcast. My pleasure. Thank you for the great questions. See you in the following weeks. <laughs>